Hello friends, welcome to Smart Catalyst. Today we'll be seeing the current affairs of 6 December 2018. The articles we'll be seeing for prelims are these six. The first article is about the Aadhaar card. Soon Aadhaar holders may get the opportunity to opt out of the Aadhaar usage. Second article is about the witness protection scheme. And the third article talks about restrictions to be bought in in Andaman and Nicobar Island. Fourth article is about the carbon emissions and India's role in contributing to those carbon emissions. Fifth article is about the newly launched high-speed data satellite GSAT. And the final article is about soil health card scheme and the soil health card app. Apart from these six articles, we are also covering some of the important news in the form of MCQs. The MCQs are attached in the form of PDF in the description below. The first article we'll be seeing is, Soon all Aadhaar holders may get an opportunity to opt out. This article was taken from the newspaper Hindu. So here the news is that the government is finalizing a proposal to amend the Aadhaar Act. We all know that Aadhaar Act was enacted in the year 2016 and the act was passed as a money bill in the Lok Sabha. However, after the passage of the Aadhaar Act in the Parliament, there was a public interest litigation filed in the Supreme Court and following that, the Supreme Court has declared the validity of Aadhaar Act 2016 with a 4-1 constitutional bench. So, in the five-judge bench ruling, the bench held that Aadhaar is valid in the larger public interest. It also held that the Aadhaar does not infringe the individual's right to privacy. However, on the other hand, the court did stuck down several important sessions of the Aadhaar Act 2016. The court held that reasonable restrictions on individual privacy is valid and it only sought that minimal biometric information of the individuals can be used. It also laid emphasis that bringing in of Aadhaar is in a legitimate aim to provide dignity to larger, marginalized population who are living under the below poverty line. On one hand, the Supreme Court held that Aadhaar is mandatory to avail the benefits of various welfare schemes, especially to target poverty, and it is also mandatory to avail income tax benefits and to file income tax returns and it also upheld that the PAN and Aadhaar card linkage. However, on the other hand, it held that Aadhaar is not necessary for school admissions or any various competitive exams such as uh, a NEET and even CBSC exams. It also insulated the children from the Aadhaar regime, that is, it said that the children need not have Aadhaar card in order to avail the benefits of Sadhva Siksha Abhyan, that is right to education for children in the age group of 6 to 14. So in the judgment, the SE did convey its dissent in order to make India going in a path of a surveillance state. So it declared that linking Aadhaar card with bank accounts as well as linking Aadhaar cards with the mobile SIM card is unconstitutional and it is the infringement of right to privacy of the individuals. However, in the 4 is to 1 judgment of Aadhaar card, the sole dissenting minority judgment of Justice D.Y. Chandra Chud expressed that denial of benefits arising out of any social security rights is violative of human dignity and impermissible under the constitutional scheme. So, any biometric authentication failure under Aadhaar will definitely lead to denial of rights. So, keeping in mind the proposals proposed by the Supreme Court, the government is trying to amend the 2016 Act. So, the recent proposal to amend will include to give call to all the citizens for option to withdraw from the Aadhaar usage, including the biometrics and also the data. There is also a provision for the children below the age of 18 years. Once the child turns 18, he or she will be given 6 months time in order to decide what she or he wants. The proposal also seeks to appoint a special officer called as adjudicating officer. So the purpose of this adjudicating officer is to decide whether person's other related personal data can be disclosed outside in the, in the name of interest of national security. So in the name of national security, a person's uh, right to privacy cannot be violated. So the purpose of appointing the adjudicating officer is to maintain balance between the both. However, the proposals do have certain concerns. So, it is already emphasized by the Supreme Court that the linking of PAN card with Aadhaar is already held constitutional by the Supreme Court. So, the recent proposal will benefit only those people who do not have PAN card or do not require one. So, but we all know that about 37 crore people in India, they already have PAN card. 
so a larger section of this people will not be able to come out of the usage of aadhar the second article will be seeing is supreme court okays witness protection scheme this article was taken from the newspaper new indian express so the central government of india there has proposed so the central government of india has proposed a draft witness protection scheme so the supreme court on viewing this draft witness protection scheme has ag- approved to implement it so this draft scheme will be in implementation until all the states come out with their own legislation the supreme court has also proposed a time period for the roll off of this scheme by the end of 2019 all the states must be implementing this witness protection scheme so in the year 2003 a committee was constituted under the chairmanship of malimat to bring in reforms into the criminal justice system so that committee proposed bringing in the witness protection measures also law commission in its 198th report proposed to bring in measures for the witness protection so under the draft witness protection measures there are special steps taken to ensure that the witness and the accused do not come in face to face there is also usage of technology via installation of cctvs alarms fencing etc in order to provide security for the witness and the identity of the witness is also concealed with name change there will be a special threat analysis report conducted and this report will examine the level of security required by the witness as well as their family and based on that there will be three categories of the witness it should also be remembered that ensuring safety of witness is very much essential in order to provide justice to the witness and this justice is very much part of our indian constitution and section 195a of ipc it has provisions for the witness protection wherein the witness can seek the help of authorities for their protection so the draft also proposes to set up what is called as vulnerable witness court rooms and there is also a special fund called as witness protection fund set up for the purpose of providing relocation or starting new vocation or profession for the witness and special steps are also taken for speedy justice on day to day basis without any adjoinments it is to be noted that such witness protection scheme is uh, globally practiced in many countries like usa united kingdom china canada and are implemented with high success rate the third article will be seeing is center may bring back curbs in andamans so this article was taken from the newspaper hindu So recently the North Sentinel Island of Andaman was in news. This is because a American citizen is supposed to have been killed by the Indian indigenous tribal group called as Sentinel group. So in the light of that the the chairman of National Commission for Scheduled Tribes has announced that there may be a revisit to its judgment to lift the restricted area permit system for 29 island including Andaman Nicobar island. So this restricted area permit was bought in in the year 1968 so and according to this permit special registration is required for the non citizens in order to visit certain areas in india and this certain areas it includes andaman nicobar and even some parts of north eastern india however in order to promote tourism this rap regime that is restricted area permit was removed recently in many areas including the north sentinel So the recent incident highlights the serious flaw in implementation of the RAP regime and the need to look into the issue further deeper. So for the prelims we have to know about National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. So this National Commission for Scheduled Tribes is a constitutional body. It was established under the provisions of Article 338 of Indian Constitution. So this body has a per- chairperson, a vice chairperson and three permanent members. So the time period for this uh, commission is 3 years. And the main purpose of setting up the commission is to protect the rights of the tribal group. So this commission has the power of civil court to safeguard the rights of the scheduled tribes and it also tables its report annually to the president. The constitution also has many articles to protect the scheduled tribes group in our country 
So Article 15, 16, which are part of fundamental rights, they have special provisions to protect the scheduled communities in our country. Article 330, it provides for a special provision for reservation of seats for scheduled tribes as well as scheduled caste people in Lok Sabha. And Article 332, it provides for reservation of seats for scheduled tribe in legislative assemblies of the state. And as I said before, Article 338, it provides provision for establishment of national commissions for scheduled tribe. The next article we'll be seeing is India's third largest contributor to carbon emissions. This article was also taken from the newspaper, The Hindu. So recently, a research was conducted by University of East Anglia and the Global Carbon Project. So this report, it provides significant insights to the India's projected carbon emissions. According to the report, India's emissions will rise by almost 6.3% from 2017 in the days to come. Not just with respect to India, the emissions of carbon globally will also rise. So the global carbon emissions will rise from 1.6% in 2017 to 2.7% in the 2018 because of heavy dependence of the fossil fuels. However, the dominance of the fossil fuels in the global energy mix is detrimental to the climate change. We all know about the increasing importance and the awareness given to the sustainable development goals and the issue of climate change. The Conference of Parties, that is a COP of United Nations Convention on Climate Change is happening currently in Poland. And one of the major aims of this COP24 conference is to bring about the equitable cut in the carbon emissions. The report also adds the role of developing nations in the carbon emission. China has recently overtaken US in its amount of carbon emitted. China accounts for almost 27% of the global carbon dioxide emissions, whereas US emission accounted for 15% of the global total. So India's position is not far behind. India is currently the third largest contributor to the global CO2 emissions and its amount of emissions is projected to steadily increase in the days to come. Currently, about 65% of total emissions of carbon dioxide from India is coming only from one source, that is coal. So this shows that it is high time that India begins to diversify its sources of energy. India in its Paris COP21 summit has announced its intended nationally determined responsibilities or contributions. So according to this, India must achieve the reduction of 33 to 35 percentage of the carbon emissions by the period of 2030. So in order to achieve the target, reduction in carbon dioxide emissions is very much necessary. So for carbon dioxide emissions to decline by at least 50% by 2030 and to reach net zero by 2050, limiting global warming, agreeing to the Paris 2015 Accord is very much necessary for all the global nations. So only if the target is met, the global temperature increase can be curtailed well below 2 degrees Celsius. The next article we'll be seeing is Big Bird to push high speed data. This article was also taken from the newspaper Hindu. And this article talks about the recently launched communication satellite of India. So this communication satellite called as GSAT-11 was launched from a place called as Guinea. It was launched from Guinea because the Guinea is geographically located closer to equator and this is because near equator the escape velocity is very less and the satellite can reach its orbit with very little push. So this GSAT-11 is a 6 ton satellite and it is also the heaviest ever built by ISRO. And as I said before, it is a communication satellite and the main purpose of this communication satellite is to provide high speed internet access. So this high speed internet access is specially targeted towards rural areas, remote areas and ideally the areas with less internet penetration now. The satellite also aims to increase the broadband connectivity to inaccessible village panchayats. So providing high speed broadband connectivity to every village panchayat and the schools is one of the main ambitions of the BharatNet project. And this GSAT-11 is a step towards achieving the goals set in the BharatNet project. 
thus by increasing the communication under remotely accessed areas other welfare services like e health e education and other benefits for the agriculture can be provided which will also help meet the government's welfareist policies the final article will be seen for prelims is launching of soil health card scheme mobile app so this news article was taken from pib so 5th december that is yesterday is celebrated throughout the world as world soil day so in order to commemorate the day the department of agriculture and cooperation which is under ministry of agriculture has launched a mobile app for soil health card so before seeing into the app we'll see about the scheme so the soil health card scheme of ministry of agriculture is a national wide program so the main aim of the program is to improve the soil health thus by increasing the soil health and fertility it will definitely have a impact on the farmers productivity as well as the farmers well being so according to the soil health card scheme information will be provided to the farmers about the optimal usage of the fertilizers according to the crops so only when there is optimum information the farmers will be able to know how much of nutrients both micro as well as macro is needed in order to protect the fertility of the soil so this scheme it follows a uniform approach to collect samples and it test them in laboratory and via the proper test information is provided to the benefit of the farmers and by using technology the government is now trying to promote the scheme in mobile app so the app will benefit field level workers that is farmers to automatically capture the geographical coordinates of the soil so the soil's health will automatically be registered in the app via the geographical coordinates in the time of collection of the sample and it will also be linked to the farmer's details via aadhar card mobile number gender address and crop details so that other welfareist schemes and the direct benefit transfer can be linked to the soil health card scheme so via this the farmers will be able to make the educated guess about the nutrient status of the soil and thereby providing appropriate levels of nutrients especially npk that is nitrogen phosphorus and potassium which will improve the soil's health as well as fertility and it is to be noted that this mobile app it functions in 14 languages taking into consideration diversity of languages as well as the literacy levels of farmers in our country the portal is also been linked to integrated fertilizer management system and via this integration there will be even an hassle free distribution of fertilizers to the farmers and this is already taken up as a pilot project in 16 districts so the articles will be seeing for mains are these three first one is about the rbi's holding important rates the second article is about electronic vehicles and the final one is about the climate change talks the first article will be saying is valid pass on rbi holding the rates so this article was taken from the newspaper hindu so the reserve bank of india that is the central bank of india has taken up a decision to leave the interest rates unchanged so we all know that the primary role of reserve bank of india is to achieve and also preserve the price stability and this price stability is achieved by controlling the inflation so and this inflation targeting is a main aim of the monetary policy and the monetary policy is decided by a special committee called as monetary policy committee This monetary policy committee consists of six members, three representatives of RBI and three others are the representatives of government. The any decision taken by the monetary policy committee is based on the consensus that is at least four members are needed for the quorum. So according to the recent changes brought in by the government, the monetary policy committee will target inflations at the rate of 4% plus or minus 2%. So if the inflation breaches this threshold then the monetary policy committee must give in writing the reasons to the government of India So what are the reasons behind the RBI's recent decision to hold the interest rate So what are the reasons for the RBI behind holding the rates The main reason is due to easing inflation
This can be attributed to global slowdown in the economic momentum. So it can also be attributed to the recent collapse of the oil prices and also unexpected softening in food inflation in India. So we all know that there are uh, inflation can be classified into two types. One is headline inflation and the second one is core inflation. So the headline inflation, it includes the total inflation including the food as well as energy. However, the core inflation, it talks about the inflation bought in by the goods and services excluding the inflation bought in by the food commodity as well as the oil. So from the definition, it is clear that headline inflation is more volatile as it consists of oil and the food prices and the core inflation is more stable. So because of the reduction in the volatility of the food prices, the RBI has adopted the policy of calibrated tightening. So currently, the RBI has kept the repo rate at 6% and the reverse repo rate at 6.25% cash reserve ratio as 4% and the bank rate at 6.75%. So repo rate is basically the rate at which the RBI lends to commercial banks and the reverse repo rate is the rate at which the commercial banks lends to RBI. So both these together are called as liquidity adjustment facilities. And the cash reserve ratio is the total deposit the banks are mandated to have in the form of liquid cash with the RBI and it is currently at 4%. And the bank rate is a rate below which the commercial banks cannot lend. So all these are important monetary tools adopted by RBI in order to keep the inflation in the economy at check. However, the RBI is also cautioned about the recent geopolitical tensions existing globally because of the global trade wars. And it is also taken a cautionary stand to stabilize the macroeconomic fundamentals of Indian economy. So this slide talks about the types of inflation. UPSC asks types of inflation for the prelims. So the first type of inflation is called as creeping inflation. So this is a stage when the prices of the goods and services are generally increasing. It is a milder form of inflation and usually the inflation is less than 3%. After creeping inflation, the next form of inflation is called as chronic inflation. So if the inflation continues to persist above the creeping stage, then it is no longer called as creeping, but it becomes a chronic inflation. So this chronic inflation can be both continuous, that is the prices can remain consistently high without any downward movement. It can also be intermittent, that is the price can raise with regular intervals. After chronic inflation, the stage is called as walking inflation. So this is at the stage when the prices of the goods raise at about 3 to 10 percent per annum. And this stage must be taken seriously in order to avoid running or even hyperinflation in the days to come. So there is also another type of inflation called as moderate inflation. So this moderate inflation is nothing but a combination of creeping as well as walking inflation. And it is a more moderated type of inflation and the price rise is less than 10% usually in single digit. So if the price rise is stable, then this inflation does not possess any serious economic threat. So after this stage comes a running inflation. This is a stage when there is rapid acceleration of inflation. And the inflation goes to take double digit form within 10% to 20%. And if there is no serious steps taken in the with the help of monetary tools, then it can cause irreversible damages to health of economy. After running inflation, uh, there is a stage called as galloping inflation. So in this stage, the even the inflation takes three digit rate and India has witnessed this stage during its second five year plan. This galloping inflation is also called as jumping inflation. So finally, there is a situation when the inflation is very, very high. And it is becomes very much difficult to curtail the situation. Such a situation is called as hyperinflation. In this hyperinflation, the value of the nation's currency, that is the fiat money, is even reduced to almost zero. So the paper money of a country is almost worthless. 
and this form of inflation has occurred in many countries like Hungary in 1950s and even in Zimbabwe. So if you put a graph against time on one side and price rise on other, possibly creeping inflation will be like this and it will next go to walking inflation stage and then running and this becomes a hyperinflation where it becomes parallel to the y-axis. The next article we'll be seeing is infrastructure for charging electronic vehicles is not an urgent need. This article was taken from the newspaper Mint. We all know that almost every vehicle in India is run by petroleum or diesel which are considered as non-renewable sources of energy. So in order to curtail the climate change by 2 degrees Celsius according to the proposed Paris Agreement, it is very much imperative for India to move away from the fossil fuel run vehicles to electric vehicles. So uh, there is no doubt that electric vehicles have bright future but their trajectory currently is highly uncertain. So we all know that the implementation of this electric vehicles in India, it does require certain infrastructure. One of the basic prerequisites is setting up of high speed charging stations. For example, consider a battery pack of about 30 kilowatt hour, say to run for about 200 kilometer range. So in order to set up such high speed charging stations, a number of states have set up regulatory commissions. So they have even specified and notified special electricity tariffs for electricity vehicles. However, this does not come without any limitations. The first point to be noted is the issue of time of day. So depending upon the time of day, there will be surplus capacity at some time. However, in the peak hours, there will be limited supply. So there must be special steps taken to de-incentivize the customers from plugging their vehicles in the peak hours, thereby balancing the surplus as well as the deficit. This can be done by providing cheaper charging during the off-peak periods, thus the customers will be nudged to charge their electric vehicles in off-peak hours. So the second issue which needs to be noted is regulating the price for the end customers. So the government has bought in a special scheme called as FAME scheme in order to promote electric mobility. So according to the re released cost estimates from the electric mobility FAME scheme, this is the statistics. So from the statistics, it is shown that at the end of the day, the final price awarded to the end customers using the electric vehicles is at almost rupees 2, which is not much different from the other sources such as CNG that is compressed natural gas. So another alternative option which will be economically beneficial will be opting cleaner sources of energy like CNG rather than investing more money in infrastructure for electric vehicles. So from the two dysfunctions it is shown that there is no one size fits all approach for implementation of infrastructure for the electric vehicles. One important point is the urban and the rural divide there will be more demand in the urban areas when compared to rural areas. So most stations need to be set up first in urban areas that, uh, before penetration into rural areas. So the second problem is the usage of adapters. So multiple cars require different adapters and the charging stations must be compatible of all these adapters at cheap prices for the uh, benefit transfer to the end customers. So apart from the public places, the infrastructure facilities must also be made available at the homes of the electric vehicles owners so that they can charge their vehicles even at home. However, all these points can be made possible only when the domestic and international manufacturing companies are tempted to build sufficient technology to implement the electric vehicles in India. Only when the manufacturing and automobile companies build electric vehicles, the FAME scheme can be implemented without any limitations. The final article we'll be seeing is Climate Change Moving Talks to Action. This article was taken from the newspaper Mint. We all know about the ongoing COP24 of UNFCCC. So under COP24, it aims to bring a unified framework to implement the decisions taken in COP21 Paris Summit. Okay. The framework will talk about 
the ways to reduce the CO2 level, which in turn leads to rise in temperature and the rise in sea level, which will contribute to more extreme weather events as happening now. Because of the increasing air pollution which lets carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it has serious detrimental effect to the health of human being. On one hand, because of a temperature raise, the uh, vector ecology is changed causing more communicable diseases such as malaria and dengue especially in the developing nations in Asia and Africa and it also causes other non-communicable diseases such as respiratory diseases. Health on other side, rising temperature causes severe weather changes and it also impacts the quality of water which in turn will have manifested effects on the food supply chain. These harmful effects will be more on the developing nations who occupy almost four-fifths of the total population of the globe. However, the developing nations which just contribute to one-fifth of the population, they are responsible for half of the global emissions. So this creates a whole level of existential crisis for the developing as well as the developed countries. So the United Nations framework is mainly aimed to curb this emission gap. by bringing in collectivity principle. For this, the United Nations also talks about the emitter pace principle. However, in spite of that, there is heavy dilution of the commitments, especially by the developed countries, which are legitimized via the multilateral negotiations. For example, recently, uh, USA, it opted out of the Paris Accord. So it insisted that it does not believe or accept in the notion of responsibility. On the other hand, developing countries like India and China, they even agreed to go forward with the diluted principle called as common but differentiated responsibility, respecting the individual countries' uh, carbon emissions. According to common but differentiated responsibility, each nation will have targets based on the amount of emissions they make into the atmosphere. And US also says that it cannot make commitments in order to transfer financial resources and technology to the developing nations. This is directly against the 2010 UNFCCC meet in a place called the Skankan in South Africa, where the developed nations agrees to set up green climate fund with from the year 2020 with a contribution of annually 100 billion. So this situation forces the developing nations to compromise in order to keep the Paris Treaty alive. The developing nations are willing to make this compromise in order to balance its global warming on one side, however developing its own economy on the other side. However, the re-emergence of a developing country of China brings in serious changes in the global governance of climate. So this has led to the first modification in the framework with the deal between US and China enabling the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Oh, another perspective which needs to be noted with respect to climate change talks is the uh, social phenomenon of urbanization. We all know that the transport emissions it contribute to almost 40% of the overall carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. So apart from the transport emissions, the building also consume more carbon dioxide even more than the industries. But the climate pact, especially the Paris and the other UNFCCC pact, they ignores the trajectory of emissions. It talks only about the emissions from the industry and the economic development, but it does not talk about the emissions from the transport sector, which is highly flawed. So in order to achieve climate justice, as in the preamble of the Paris Agreement of 2015, the environmental framework must also talk about all the sources of the emission of gases. So only such an environmental law framework will be acceptable and with it will yield sustainable results. So thus putting an inclusive, equitable, sustainable development is what is needed for the emerging world in order to maintain the global order.